tail end of 2018, Kodansha put out their second graphic novel anthology based on a mock work of manga that they also publish in print in English. Um, after their Attack on Titan anthology, we have now one for, based on Masamune Shirao's Ghost in the Shell, titled Ghost in the Shell, Global Neural Network. As the Attack on Titan anthology, this collection has a selection of standalone short stories from various writers set in the universe of Ghost in the Shell, though not all of them feature the main characters of the manga or anime series, and the creators aren't as high profile as the creators of the Attack on Titan anthology. There are four stories in this collection, and I'll break them down one by one. As I have a physical copy of the book, I'm going to be doing this vlog style. Because I don't have screen grabs or a digital copy I can just take captures from. The first story is Automatic Behavior by Alex Gladstone and David Lopez. Gladstone is the creator of the Book Burners series, while Lopez has done art with or All New Wolverine with Tom Taylor and Captain Marvel with Kelly Sue DeConnick. If you read the free comic book day preview for this book, this is the story you got, and it's certainly the book putting its best foot forward. The story is the Major teaming up with a former compatriot from Shanghai named Lee as they try to rescue Aramaki after he's kidnapped by someone who is intending to ghost hack him. Really good story, both in terms of the interplay between Kusanagi and Lee and in terms of how Aramaki handles his captors. While they have him physically under their control, psychologically, Aramaki is generally in control of the situation. The story really captures the tone of Ghost in the Cell's standalone complex while telling the kind of story that we didn't necessarily see in the show. We had a couple of episodes of Aramaki in a bad situation or in peril. Um, the one with the where Aramaki is caught in the wine bank hostage situation. Perfectly come to mind, but nothing quite like this. Next up is Red Bloods by Alex DeCapi and Giannis. Mangle this pronunciation. Milono Giannis. DeCapi has directed a bunch of music videos, as well as writing the IDW comic miniseries Soap, Smoke, and also Archie vs. Predator. Giannis has worked on the G.I. Joe comic with IDW, along with working on his own project called Profit, which was published to Image and has an art style that looks like a mix of Mobius and, well, Romas and Mune. Appropriately enough, this is the story that most seeks to emulate the visual style of the manga, complete with little super-deformed comedic bits every now and then. Red Blood's fault involves investigation into the background of a cyborg girl who appears to have a second ghost buried inside her cyberbrain. The team ends up taking Togusa and Saito, the two least augmented members of the team, North America and the former U.S., the first time someone has actually shown the former U.S. and the Ghost of the Show. In standalone complex, there was some time spent in Mexico, but not inside what is now what is the United States. It's interesting in multiple respects, in addition to that. Ilona Giannis does a good job of emulating the less pervy elements of Shiro's style, and Togusa and Saito are two characters who we don't see as much time together on mission. Usually Togusa is paired off with Major or with Bato, and Saito, being the team sniper, is kind of off doing his own thing. And they have some very interesting interplay. The penultimate work in the piece is After the Ball is Over by Genevieve Valentine and Brent Schnuver. Valentine took part in the Attack on Titan anthology, and before that wrote for a Cat or the Catwoman series for DC back in 2014, along with various works of prose fiction. Brent, try to avoid mangling his name, in addition to having a last name that is both fun and difficult to, to say, Hoover, Hoover, I also done penciling for Ant-Man at Marvel in 2015, and also worked on Batman 66 and Adventures of Superman before that at DC in 2013. Most recently, he's been doing art for X-Men Red, which I've read and generally enjoyed. After the Ball is Over is the sole story of the piece which doesn't have any members of Section 9 in it, both a strength and a weakness. Not involving Section 9, or the major key members of the group, along with placing the story in the form of the U.S., gives the story a sense of tension that you wouldn't otherwise get with Section 9. The fates of all of these characters are up in the air. It's why in the Animatrix, a lot of the stories there work so well as the cast of the main films barely, if ever, show up, so all bets are off. They're also able to show a chunk of the world that hasn't been narratively depicted, which 
in, as far as the United States chunk is concerned, it's in a different part of the U.S., more along the northern border near Canada and uh, Montana in that area. Thus, they have a general freedom aside from the more general world building that Shiro did in the original works to expand on things. On the other side of the coin, I keep expecting some member of Section 9 to show up for the MacGuffin to end up being delivered to the Major so she or Aramaki or someone else can weaponize its mere existence against people going after our protagonists. Not the case. Still a solid cyberpunk story. It ends up being one that, well, in a lot of ways, could be removed entirely from this anthology and otherwise function unchanged. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but when I'm coming to a Ghost in the Shell anthology as opposed to just a um, broader cyberpunk anthology, I keep looking for some slightly stronger hooks back to the source material. Again, with the Attack on Titan anthology, you have, even if you don't incorporate the main characters of the work, you have the ever-present threat of the Titans. And it doesn't have to be any recognizable Titans. Titans themselves stand alone as a threat. Never mind the walled city there where the show mainly takes place. Finally, there's Star Gardens by Brandon Fleischer and Lorenzo Piazzi. Lurgs, Burns, L-R-N-Z. That Toddy, most high-profile work is his graphic novel Golem. While Fletcher has written for Gotham Academy and Batgirl, kind of when they started meshing into each other. Of the stories in the series, this one goes in the most transhumanist direction of the work, thinking too much of the spoilers, in particular the idea of the idea economy. We get into a post-scarcity transhumanist society. That said, there's one bit that rubs me the wrong way. Major kind of gets punked early on here, getting semi-ghost hacked. It's not that Kusanagi hasn't been ghost hacked in a ghost in the show work before. It's just that the instance that I recall seeing that happen was in a rise, very early in her career, and well before Section 9 was formed. Her getting caught this badly off guard here, guard here feels like a mischaracterization. It's not the problem with the major showing vulnerability. It's that her vulnerability tends towards the... She either gets too professional, like when she gets a, becomes opposed to the slowly developing independence and individuality of the Tachikoma since she's one of standalone complex or her background with Kuzain second gig or even this Mamoru Oshi film where seeing a person with her cyber body exactly like hers on the street of Port City gives her a serious crisis of faith in her very ghost. That she actively bites off more than she can chew taking on a think tank or an incredibly strong combat cyborg by herself instead of trying to hold on for backup. Her weakness isn't that she's a bad, that she's a vulnerable hacker, that she can get mentally messed with, or like hacked, taken out in that respect, or taken on in that respect. Major's flaw isn't one where a rando can punch through her cyber defenses out of the blue, and having this happen in the story feels off. I can't help but feel that if Fletcher was looking for a way in the narrative to hook the Major into this particular story, there were better ways. So, that's four stories, each most more or less standing alone, and they generally make for a strong combination. I picked up the print edition from my local comic shop and generally enjoyed it, but if you're not really into, stand, into Ghost in the Shell already, I can't recommend it. It's like a bunch of Good to interesting standalone episodes of the TV series. Worth experiencing, but not necessarily great, and not something where if you're going to sell someone who's unfamiliar with Ghost in the Shell in the first place, this is not the thing I'd use to pick them up on. I'd go with the original works. Now, as always, if you're interested in picking this up, there will be referral links in the show notes for where you can get it.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.